let me introduce you to the steam explosion. Steam explosions are nasty, very, very, very dangerous. Uh, I know one train, it was a major train disaster when they used steam locomotives. They let the boiler get too dry and they had a steam explosion. Killed the entire crew, killed a whole pile of people on the train, it was bad. It's the same principle with a car radiator. Liquids under pressure have a higher boiling point than liquids at atmospheric pressure. So in other words, if you take a pressure cooker, that's the, the reason you have pressure cookers, is you can cook at higher temperatures using water. And if, has anybody paid close attention? You've got your pressure cooker, and it's got the little pretty gauge on top, and it's got a little pretty red line on that gauge. Has anybody noticed where the temperature is that that pretty red line starts at? No? Let me give you a big hint. 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Don't go there. It's a bad, bad. Stay, stay away, okay? The reason is, at that temperature, you have a catastrophic increase in both pressure and temperature, okay? Now, what happens when that water is under pressure, you can get that water to, uh, what does water boil at in Fahrenheit? I don't even know what it is. 212? Okay. So you can get water up to 250, 275, 280 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not boiling yet. But now, if you were to take the lid off that pot, it is now 50, 60 degrees above boiling temperature, so, it's, so it should be steam. And that's what it does. It instantly turns into steam. And incredibly powerful. If you've taken the rag cap off your car when it was hot, you know what I mean. It's a bad thing. Don't do it. Another bad thing you don't want to do, and we'll see if anybody else has done this, has anybody taken a harmless chicken egg, put it in the microwave, closed the door, and pressed the ONOFF switch to the ON position? <laughs> has anybody done that? One, okay, two, what happened? Blew up? Yeah. Okay, and this is what I mean when I say don't do this, okay? This is extremely dangerous. Be warned, okay? I've heard more than one story of eggs blowing the door clean off a microwave oven. The reason is, is because an egg pressurizes the water inside the egg. The water inside the egg gets above boiling point, and the pressure increases. Eventually, the eggshell can't take it anymore, and it fails, starting with a little itty-bitty crack. That's all it takes. That crack allows the pressure inside the egg to drop. The water is now 10, 15, 20 degrees above boiling point, and the water flashes to steam, and the whole egg explodes. I've heard other stories of eggs going clean through the metal casing and sticking on the ceiling of the house. It's very, very, very dangerous. Uh, besides just burning you, I mean, it can, it can maim you, okay? Uh, so it's, don't put an egg in the microwave. <laughs> Crack it first, okay? That's fine then. But remove that pressure. Now, let's move upscale a little. This is very much like the egg in the microwave. You have this hard shell keeping the pressure on the water. The water, something caused it, the temperature in the water to increase to the point where that upper crust failed. It could no longer take the pressure. It cracked starting in the middle, working both ways out, and once that crack started, that was all it took. The pressure down here dropped to essentially atmospheric pressure. The water explodes to steam and explodes through that crack supersonically. Now, when it does so, what have I got next here? Okay, no, we're going to take a couple look at examples of water under pressure. Mount St. Helens. Everyone remembers Mount St. Helens, right? Well, except maybe you guys. Yeah, you won't remember. I remember. I was pretty young at the time, though. Okay, Mount St. Helens. Here's what it looked like before the eruption. Nice, pretty mountain. It grew a bulge in its side. Tremendous steam and heat under pressure, under the bulge, until eventually a landslide released the pressure. The moment the landslide happened, the water, what dropped to atmospheric pressure, flashed to steam with the equivalent of the Hiroshima nuclear bomb worth of energy. That dome then blew sideways, blew out the side of the mountain, blew this way. On the other side of that mountain uh, were uh, mountains full of trees. As you can see, leveled trees for miles. Leveled them. Spirit Lake is on the opposite side. It blasted Spirit Lake this way, up this side of the mountain, which then washed back down in, washed all the dirt and trees off this mountain into the lake, 
making that floating log mat. So it basically blasted the entire lake up the mountain and washed it back down again. So there's the floating, mo floating log mat there now. Uh, we talked about that briefly one of the other nights. Uh, the trees are now sinking roots first into the bottom of the lake. Very interesting because that might be a mechanism to explain the many uh, fossil forests we see of trees that are buried upright that may explain them. Now in Tambora, this was another example, uh, another, another volcano that erupted, the explosion was heard 1,400 kilometers away. Let's see if I can find Tambora on here. Tambora was heard uh, 1,400 kilometers away, so that'd probably be you know, way over here somewhere, blew the top 1,650 meters, that's over, over 4,000 feet, off the top of the mountain, gone, poof. <clears throat> Expelled at an estimated 150 cubic kilometers of ash, that's supposed to be ash, <laughs> falling as far away as 1,300 kilometers. It formed a hole in the ground six kilometers in diameter. Okay, for you people who are not metric, that's, uh, what would that be, about four miles, give or take? So that's a pretty big hole in the ground, okay? Pretty big explosion. It killed 10,000 people in the immediate vicinity. An estimated 82,000 worldwide died from starvation and disease. Why? Because it actually altered the global weather patterns. It was called the year without summer. It actually snowed in July here in the US. That was one volcano, only one. Now, Krakatoa. Where's Krakatoa? Krakatoa. Okay, more than half the island vanished in one giant explosion heard 3,000 kilometers away in Madagascar. Let me switch hands here so you can see better. 3,000 kilometers away. That is a heck of a bang. <laughs> Rocks were thrown 50 kilometers into the air. Again, this was one volcano, only one. The ash cloud ejected 80 kilometers into the air, turned day into night, nearly 500 kilometers in all directions. So over 300 miles in all directions. Bright daylight? It wasn't. It was dark. It was nighttime. The eruption caused a tsunami. Now, we, after the Indonesian tsunami, I don't need to explain what that is. We already know. Uh, it was no comparison compared to the Indonesian one, but 36,000 people were killed worldwide by that tsunami. Waves measuring 125 feet high swept inland as far as nine, 790 feet above sea level. It decimated hundreds of villages in Indonesia. That was one volcano, only one. The waves were clocked at Cape Horn, booked it along at 800 kilometers an hour. That's like 500 miles an hour. 6,000 ships worldwide were destroyed from that tsunami. What I'm trying to demonstrate here is the idea of global catastrophism from modern day events, and these are very minor compared to what's gone on in the past. For example, Yellowstone Park, we now know, is actually one giant hole in the ground left behind by a volcano. And the thing that amazed me when I went through Yellowstone was the miles and miles and miles of hot springs and volcanic activity you can see all around you. And this is why. It's been a whole series of volcanoes for instance, Mount St. Helens, by uh, example, only ejected one cubic kilometer of magma, left behind basically no caldera, no hole in the ground, basically. Krakatoa, by comparison, blew 18 cubic kilometers of magma and left a six-foot kilometer hole in the ground. Crater Lake, okay, so that's the explosion area from Crater Lake explosion, one of the Yellowstone Park explosions. 75 cubic kilometers of magma were blasted into the air. It left a hole in the ground 30 kilometers long by 15 kilometers wide. Pretty big hole. Lava Creek Tuff. So there's the explosion area from Lava Creek Tuff. Left a hole in the ground 75 kilometers long. That's pushing 50 miles. It left uh, 50 miles long and about 30 miles wide. Big hole in the ground. Blasted about 1,000 cubic kilometers worth of magma. And then the big one. Huckleberry Ridge, roughly an estimated 2,500 cubic kilometers were blasted into the air, left a hole in the ground 100 kilometers in diameter. It's about 60 miles in diameter. That was one volcano. When you start taking a look at these numbers, you can see where Walt gets his numbers. 
If we're scaling up, we could estimate that the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff, just one eruption, was the energy equivalent of 2 million megatons of TNT. You can start to see where Walt gets his numbers when he says, the hydroplate event was a cataclysmic flood whose waters erupted from worldwide subterranean in interconnected chambers with an energy release exceeding the explosion of 10 billion hydrogen bombs. You can start to see what gets his numbers. Now, what happened here? That crack begins to erode. Now, as it erodes, again, the crack would have been uh, following what is now the mid-oceanic ridge. So this would have been the crack in the upper crust. So water now jets out of there. According to his calculations, supersonic steam would have jetted up 70 miles into the atmosphere. Wait a minute, back up a second. How high was that supposed ice canopy? Was anybody taking notes? 10 miles, someone was taking notes, you win, okay. Talk to me later, I'll give you a prize. Okay, <laughs> 10 miles, wait a minute. Steam is going to melt that ice. So suddenly, this explains why the canopy was also destroyed at the same time as the flood. It's about the only thing that would bring it down. It transformed it back into water. It fell just along with all the other water. After being blasted up, it fell this tremendous rain like the Earth has never seen before or since. That canopy would have collapsed at least partially at first along with that rain and probably collapsed slowly over the next several centuries. Now, as that water erupted through that crack, it would have eroded the sides of the crack. Now, this is one side of the crack, the left side, for example, okay? So the water, as it comes up through here, the water coming out of here would have eroded the continents in this shape, that hydroplate, the upper granite crust. It would have eroded it in this shape, and Walt goes into the physics and math in his book. And by the way, Walt's entire book is online for, for viewing for free. Creationscience.com is where you can read that. So it would have eroded it in this shape. So when the water finally ran out and the upper crust settled, gee, that matches pretty identically what we actually see on the continental shelf. Water gradually sloping off to 300 to 600 feet, drastically dropping off to the ocean floor. It lines up. Now, what would happen is that crack would erode, and it gets wider and wider until finally all this rock is now gone. There's, this rock down here is under pressure. Has anybody taken two bricks and placed them on a waterbed beside each other? I'm curious. Nobody else has. Okay, that's fine. Look, I did it. I, it's a science, okay? So, anyway, if you do that, and you can try this at home, kids, ask your parents first. Okay, don't go throw lobbing bricks on your waterbed, okay? If you place them on a waterbed, you'll notice that the waterbed bulges up between them. It's the exact same principle. Eventually, you will get a point to a point where this crack erodes wide enough Walt figures it was somewhere around 800 miles, that now the rock underneath is going to jump up and bulge up. Wait a minute, we now have a mechanism for continental division. Dead simple. What made the continents move? Gravity. It's that simple. The continents slid downhill away from each other. They still had lubricating water, which was still escaping from the fountains of the Great Deep underneath them. They slid downhill away from each other. Now, if you were to follow the mid-oceanic ridge around the globe, you'll notice it crosses the equator in two places. Right here in the Atlantic and right here in the Pacific. Now the thing is, in the Pacific, it simply crosses the equator. But in the Atlantic, it actually follows the equator for about 800 miles. And so, because the Earth is spinning, the centrifugal force of the Earth would cause the mid-oceanic ridge to jump up first right here. And so, that mid-oceanic ridge first started to rise, starting here, spreading north and south, and working its way around the globe. Now, watch what happens. These are molded from, in the shape of the hydroplate. So basically, this is molded going by the continental shelf. The continental shelf is marked in pink. It's the shallowest water depth. So the continental shelf, these continental hydroplates are molded to that shelf. If we take those and put them against the base of the mid-oceanic ridge, 
It's nearly a perfect fit, far better than Bullard's model. Now, unfortunately, this was on display at the Akron Fossils and Science Center, and it got beat up pretty bad. So <laughs> the shape isn't quite right, but it's pretty much a perfect fit except for two places, right here and right here, which can both be accounted for if we only flatten out the mountain ranges on the east coast just a little bit. So it's actually a very good fit for both Africa, the African hydroplate continent, and the North and South American hydroplate continent. And so what apparently happened is that mid-oceanic ridge jumped up, starting there, which caused these two continents to start sliding first. All they did was slide east and west of each other to their current positions. Nothing complicated, but it works quite well. And that's all it took. It took gravity and a whole lot of water. That's all it took. So now, the North American continent, for example, is now sliding westward, according to Walt Brown's math, exceeding, uh, achieving speeds of up to 45 miles an hour. It now reaches the Pacific rise and other resistances. It also starts to run out of water. So what happens? Just like a car hitting a brick wall, it crashes to a halt. This is why the mountain ranges on the west coast run roughly parallel to the mid-oceanic ridge. And something I mentioned briefly, which I won't go into detail tonight, but my study has been more on the east coast where the mountain ranges have apparently rotated. Why? Because they've moved quickly, so fast that Coriolis forces apparently may have played a role and actually rotated the land masses as they were sliding westward. Coriolis effect only works at high speed. So it all fits in to one very fine model. Now, a big question that comes up with flood skeptics, they say, well, wait a minute, how did the fish survive? For instance, if it was a saltwater flood, how did the freshwater fish survive? If it was a freshwater flood, how did the saltwater fish survive? Hey, good question. I'm all for asking good questions. So I asked a good question to a friend of mine, again, Andrew Rodenbeck, I showed you his picture before. Andrew Rodenbeck's dad is actually a marine biologist, and Andrew might as well be because his knowledge is off the scale when it comes to marine biology. So I asked him, you know, how do you explain that? He wrote back some very interesting comments. First, he explained why it's a problem for fish. In freshwater, fish lose a lot of salt through their gills, and in salt water, they lose water. So you've got a problem either way. He is quite convinced that God originally uh, created the fish to live in brackish water, partially salty and that the pre-flood seas were actually brackish water. He's convinced of that. He goes on to explain, says, energy is expended in active molecular transport to counter diffusion in each case, but fish have the easiest time in one-third to one-half strength salt water, brackish water, basically. Now, this is where it gets interesting. It is fair to say that Andrew has literally raised thousands of fish species, literally. He started rhyming them off. He really knows his stuff. He's actually built... Uh, aquariums that were completely self-supporting. He left for six months, came back, the fish were still, five, were still fine. The fish fed themselves, he had algae and stuff growing in there, the water produced its own oxygen, dealt with its own carbon dioxide, etc. Okay, he did all this in a, basically essentially a closed unit. Uh, it's mind-boggling the stuff he's done. Many fish species can acclimate from full salt to fresh. This can be accomplished either just taking them out of fresh water and throwing them into salt water, or vice versa but with the most healthy fish surviving, but the fish will be happier and less stressed if you simply spread it out over, get this, hours. It doesn't even take days or weeks or months. He can get, he can get fish, freshwater fish, acclimatized, acclimatized to salt water in hours, and the fish are quite happy with it. It just doesn't stress them out that way if he takes his time. So when salt or freshwater sick is, uh, fre salt or freshwater fish is sick, I have successfully treated them by moving them to the less stressful environment of brackish water. Interesting. So I only move them back because, hmm, well, maybe I'll just keep them in the brackish water all the time now and see how that goes. <laughs> that was exactly how he wrote it, so I had to put that in there. So that's it for tonight. I hope that I've sort of waded you through this whole thing and tied it all together. Um, ooh, it's 20 after 8. Uh, tell you what, I won't take time for questions. If you've got Q&A afterwards, you can come up to me and ask me afterwards. 
Uh, but I did want to say thank you very much for having me here this week. Uh, greatly appreciated it. Thank you for the students for coming out to all the video shoots and for helping us to produce this video series. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, no creationist is doing an exhaustive video series like this anymore that I know of. And so it's a huge need that really needed to be, really needed to be done. And doing it at home was a tremendous amount of work. So I really appreciate the camera crews, the audio guys, and the church for hosting this. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, have a good evening. Well, good morning, everyone. This is it. Last stretch. And uh, if we can, I will try and leave time this morning for questions and answers, because uh, I know that's something that everybody likes to have. And uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, so we left off with the, uh, we, we did an introduction to the fossil record, some of the surprises we find there, and now I want to take a look at some of the supposed evidence for evolution. And of course, we might as well start with Darwin. Anybody recognize these or their significance? Oh, one or two? Again, all the old people like me. Well, except for him, okay. <laughs> Darwin's finches, of course, was supposed to be the evidence that uh, Darwin used to convince the world that evolution was true. And what happened was he studied finches on the Galapagos Islands and noted a lot of differences, and they are quite, there is quite a bit of variation there between the beaks and between the bodies themselves and the appearance of the birds, which changed according to seasons and, more importantly, according to food and diet. Uh, for instance, during dry times, the nuts were harder and harder to crack open, and so consequently the finch beaks got quite large and heavy. It was more to do with diet and environment than anything. Now, this is supposed to be evidence or proof of evolution. However, it's not proof of evolution. First of all, all of these finches can still interbreed. Secondly, when the seasons got wet again and the nuts got soft again, the finches just went back to their normal, smaller beaks. This is microevolution, not macroevolution. Are they still finches? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, they're still finches. That's the bottom line. Nothing has changed. Now, this, of course, is one of the displays in the Big Valley Creation Science Museum. I wanted to give you a quick tour of that uh, sometime during this week, but I didn't get the chance. Just go and visit the website, bigvalleycreationsciencemuseum.com. All one word. Uh, that's uh, Canada's first permanent creation museum, just opened this past summer, and we hit the news like you wouldn't believe. It was unreal. Okay, here's good old Pro Creation Magazine. That's a sarcastic comment, by the way. Uh, Time Magazine, and on the cover they have a picture of what I like to call the Flintstone fossil, which uh, I actually picked up from my good friend Tino Gropi. This is Artipithecus ramidus kadabadabadoo. So, on the front cover, they proclaim the statement, how apes became human. I'll save you the time. Don't bother reading it. They don't tell you how apes became human, okay? However, please notice the picture. Let's get a load of what they said in the article. Uh, Hale Selassie and his colleagues haven't collected enough bones yet to reconstruct with great precision what Kadaba looked like. Gee, that didn't seem to slow them down much, did it? See, this is supposed to be half ape, half human, a hominid, if you will. Now, uh, they do know it was about the size of a modern common chimpanzee, which when standing, average about four feet tall. This makes it roughly the same size as its close relative, A. Ramidus Ramidus, and about 20% taller than Lucy, the famous 3.2 million year old human ancestor, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Discovered about 50 miles away in 1974. Now, the size of Kadaba's brain and the relative proportions of its arms and legs were probably chimp-like as well. Now, yesterday we got a crash course in paleontology and digging up fossils and examining the fossils. And as I said, in the words of Scientific American, the fossils are set in stone, their interpretation is not. But now that you're trained professionals, here is Artipithecus ramidus Kadaba. Please examine these bones very carefully and tell me how you would estimate the size of its brain. You can't. However, evolutionists make the assumption on the brain size based on evolutionary presuppositions. It has nothing to do with the evidence. 
And in fact, this is incredibly scant evidence. Ironically, when they show it on the cover of Time magazine, teeth are the most common bones they have, but they show it with its mouth closed. So my point here is always go back to the original evidence whenever you hear a claim about a supposed intermediate fossil, especially because the news media tends to promulgate it as something it is not, something really impressive. Now, in that article in Time magazine, they show this toe bone right here with the caption, this toe bone proves that Kadaba walked upright. Now, uh, Dr. Joseph Mastropaiello then wrote an article responding to this in which he compared that toe bone to human toe bones, baboon toe, toe bones, and chimpanzee toe bones. His conclusion was that it was most similar to the human toe bone, but still dissimilar enough to raise questions. The conclusion of his article was that their claims that walked upright was nothing less than far-fetched speculation. Yet, that is precisely what happens all the time. This brings us to an interesting point. It is possible that that toe bone is a human toe bone. And if you read the article, get this, you have to read it carefully, that toe bone was found 16 kilometers, that's 10 miles, away from the rest of the skeleton. Do you think that toe bone was part of that skeleton? No. I wouldn't think so. But because of evolutionary assumptions, it's on the same layer, therefore it must be the same time period. Humans weren't around at that time period, according to evolution. Therefore, it can't be a human toe bone. It must belong to the only species that was human-like at the time. It must be Cadabas. Can you see their reasoning here? Bones fit together perfectly. Why would they fit together too perfectly, except it doesn't fit his evolutionary preconceptions? In the words of the narrator in Nova, no problem. So what he's got here, he is using a Dremel. He is actually modifying the bone fragments to make them fit more like a human hip joint or a human hip bone. And they actually brazenly admit this right on camera. <laughs> 